Macho Man Randy Savage. Ooh, yeah. Ooh, yeah. Complete mental insanity. Everybody, when they're talking about Randy, they're, they're never going to speak in their own voice. They're going to do a Randy voice. They're going to do Macho voice every single time. I am the Lord and Master of the Ring. The growl that he would have. But I was going to do something devastating. It's more about quiet than it is loud. Cream will rise to the top. Oh, yeah. Dude, it's all in the fingers. Living yeah. the words. Dance outside. Yeah. Step into a Slim Jim. Step into a Slim Jim. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Ooh, yeah. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <coughs> no, no, what happened? I did my Randy Savage voice and I choked on it. Wouldn't it great we didn't wear the same outfit? <laughs> he was a pop culture phenomenon. This is unbelievable. Randy loved it. There was no faking anything with him. He believed everything he did. Oh, I'll be in the ring till they throw my withered carcass in a bag and drag me to the dumpster. Let me tell you something, Dingleberry. David Perry. We had a little magic in the bottle here. The ones that stand the test of time are the things that are real. So long as you both do it. Ooh, yeah! Three minutes of peak time. He was a wild man. Ooh, yeah! In this corner, from Downers Grove, Illinois, weighing 225 pounds, Angelo Puffo. My father was a wrestler and he was traveling around. Randy was born in Columbus, Ohio, and I was born in Calgary, Alberta. Our kids went to lots of schools. When we finally settled down, we were in Downers Grove, Illinois, and it was nice for them to have roots. His mother was from Germany, and she was Jewish when Hitler was in power, so his mother had had an extremely difficult life. Randy was really something. He was so different. The first complaint we got, his teacher that he had for the fourth grade said, he can't sit still a minute. He sees a piece of paper on the floor 10 feet away, and he has to get up and pick it up. The earliest memory of my brother is like having two fathers. He gave me a lot of instructions, let's put it that way. If he felt I wasn't giving my maximum effort, is that the best you can do? When he was in high school, we had a lot of kids that were being bullied. He and his friend, they used to escort the, the kids that were being bullied from class to class so they wouldn't get picked on. He used to say, you want to pick on this kid now? Always for the underdog. He was so busy with the sports because he played basketball, football, and baseball. He never dated, but all the girls liked him. He didn't have time to date. He had homework. He had to get his sleep. He had to get up early to practice. It was always something to practice, practice, practice. He moved to Tampa, Florida in 1971 to about 75 to play baseball. Apparently he was a very successful baseball player because he had made it to the minor leagues with the White Sox, the Reds, and the St. Louis Cardinals. Professional baseball was the first endeavor that I encountered, and I did it rather well. I did it rather well, I have to admit myself. Started out in 1971, St. Louis Cardinals, minor leagues. He was a catcher. And then he had an accident at home plate with a collision, and he separated his shoulder. And then he did the impossible. He learned to throw left-handed. And he signed as a left-handed first baseman with the Chicago White Sox. But what I did do was I was a switch hitter and a switch thrower. That means I could hit and throw with both arms, which no other wrestler, no other baseball player, no other hockey player, no other football player, no other nothing could do with an athletic background like that. Yeah. If it's even true, I couldn't imagine what, what he had to do to make that work. I mean, you just have to be some kind of blessed, super freak athlete for that even to be an option. He made the first cut, the second cut, third cut, and then they cut him. He was a right-handed thrower, and then he learned to throw left-handed. So they said he looked funny, and they couldn't put him on the White Sox. It broke his heart when he was no longer involved. He threw away his bats, he broke them. 
He said, they're finished with me, I'm finished with them. He asked his dad, how do you get to the top in wrestling? That was the beginning. Randy never spoke about baseball anymore. It was always wrestling. I 100% think that all greatness comes from failure. And I think all greatness comes from being overlooked for doing it wrong. Him not looking good throwing that ball probably affected how he performed in the ring. So now he goes to his dad's business, the thing he grew up around, the thing that he knows and he's passionate about, and he makes it look great. In 1979, we got a family business started, the ICW, International Championship Wrestling. The inevitable, Randy Macho Man Savage. Welcome back, wrestling fans. We take you now to the Capitol Plaza Sports Center. Macho Man, Randy Savage. My brother was gung-ho onto it. One reversal by the Macho Man. John King takes it down, shoulders down. He had those feet hooked over his shoulders. The only thing that comes with a second-generation wrestler is following in your father's footsteps, and you got to toe the line. Angelo was a tough guy, so Randy had to deal with a lot, especially when he made the transition. In the 80s and in the 70s, there were territories, and every area had its own promoter. Mid-South, Louisiana, Oklahoma, Florida, Georgia, there were all these different fiefdoms of promotions that promoted their unique area. The first time I met Randy Macho Man Savage was almost 40 years ago. He was running a little outlaw promotion, independent promotion up around Kentucky area, and they were doing the invasion on Memphis wrestling where I was from. We started in Lexington, Kentucky, and we spread out in every direction. We considered it our town. And all of a sudden, the Pafos opened up uh, their own local wrestling promotion. Randy Savage has to beat both these men in 10 minutes. The first time they tried to run their shows, they didn't draw very many people. So I think that's why they turned their formula around and said, look, if we're going to draw money, we've got to challenge the other company, you know, our company against them. Our boss told us, whatever we do, don't ever say anything on our live TV show about them, because sooner or later, if you don't talk about your opponent, they're going to go away. Jerry Lawler's dad is dead, man. He ain't healthy, man. He's in his grave somewhere. Through. Randy would come on TV and challenge me. Say, Jerry Lawler, you know, this week, I, when I get you down in that arena, you know, I, I will beat your brains out if you show up. The Macho Man Randy Savage, and I ain't being under no longer, no. Four years, man! Where's Lawler? And we felt like they were, you know, almost false advertising to, to their audience. You know, this, like, they're building up a match between me and Randy Savage that, that we know is never going to take place because we don't have anything to do with them. It escalated into what we felt like was a gang war. I mean, people started carrying guns on the trips. You know, that's how scary this thing got at one point, because the, the Pafos were known then around the territory as being nuts. But finally, I think what really brought this thing to a head was the fact that the Pafos ran out of money. Well, he does a backflip off the ropes. Count as one, two. I was at Jerry Lawler's house one night, so he read me this letter that Randy had sent to him saying, look, we're leaving the territory. Everything that we said, we apologize for. Hopefully one day we can work together. I said, what a home run. That's going to be a complete sellout. King of the Macho Man. Woo, been a lot of talk about this meeting. This is something that, boy, had been talked about for years. Randy Savage against Jerry the King Lawler and completely sold out. Randy caused quite a stir when he joined up with Memphis Wrestling. I mean, people knew he was going to be a very big deal. My mother thought of Macho Man, but the song by the YMCA Village people, the song Macho Man was first. <laughs> Where did the name Savage come from? 
Well, I think he earned it. <laughs> I think. And the prophet told me he says better to be rich and dead than poor and alive. He never, ever in his life came to me for any advice. If there was advice, he would give me advice, but he wouldn't ask for advice. And then he absolutely floored me, and he said, Lanny, I need help. When you sit some people that go up there and say that the macho man can be beat, those are 10,000 people telling 10,000 lies. I said, you've changed your name to Savage. You've got hair like a savage. You wrestle like a savage. Who is the best savage type interview that you've ever seen? Let's copy him. And he says, okay. How about Pampero Furpo? He has done it. Pampero Furpo, the wild bull of the Pampas. And oh, yeah. And he goes, ooh, yeah. And I went, I, George, I think he's got it. The manager came up to me and he says, hey, you don't play baseball no more, man. You're fired. Yeah, they do that. When you're not good enough, or they think that you're not good enough, they get you out of there. They take your uniform out of your locker. I promise you, I never heard that voice again, his other voice. I got my head together later that night. I stared at a candle and I said, Randy Savage, you are going to be the greatest at something someday, yeah. Hogan was larger than life. He was literally like a real life superhero. And WWE needed a real life super villain. You want to look for unique personalities and unique personas, or you see something and someone you could then take that and apply uh, a new concept to. In those days, I mean, there were all these little fiefdoms, all these little territories had very rich characters. And so it was, uh, the question is whether or not they wanted to come to work at WWE or stay where they were. When the WWE began its national expansion, to come on board to the WWE meant now you're exposed to the entire country. Now you're going nationwide. It was national exposure, and exposure that a lot of the talent had never experienced before. Ladies and gentlemen, you're going to meet, without a doubt, one of the fastest rising stars in the World Wrestling Federation, a man who is really making a rep reputation for himself almost overnight, as a matter of fact. Would you please welcome Randy the Macho Man Savage. <laughs> I think Randy left Memphis uh, probably, uh, in hindsight, just at the right time. Somebody said something about Hulkamania. Yeah. Somebody said something about Hulkamania, and I answered it with Macho Madness. Yeah, so I'm feeling real, real good, and I will be the next Macho Madness. This contest is scheduled for one fall. The Macho Man, Randy Savage, who is quite a competitor, making his World Wrestling Federation debut. The top wrestlers that had only been seen in these local markets, they wanted to be seen nationwide. They wanted to be worldwide stars. Well, he's, he's a very good wrestler, but he's a very mean individual, but uh, he has certainly has been a winner. That's what happened with Randy. He wanted to be seen on the biggest stage. Pacho man, Randy Savage. Ooh, another one. I think these managers are out here all to take a look at Randy I Savage. I think so. The Macho Man congratulated by Bobby the Brain Heenan. There by Freddie Blassie, Jimmy Hart, Mr. Fuji with a handshake. My goodness, I can't believe what I'm seeing. Here is your winner, Randy Macho Man Savage. When I first met him, I'm going, hmm, he's small compared to the size of our performers at that time. I think Randy was very subconscious about being smaller. Randy wasn't the biggest in size and stature. However, Randy made up for the size differential with his intensity. It's all over. It is all over. The World Wrestling Federation. Look at this maneuver. Wow. At that point, managers were very, very important. 
Everyone was sitting around waiting to find out who would manage this new heralded talent. He has invited all of the managers who were bidding for his services. He's invited they had Bobby Heenan come out and go, Randy, let me tell you why the brain should be your manager. Then Jimmy Hart came out, hey, let me tell you why you should be a manager. Macho Madness at this peak right now. And we gotta know who the manager is gonna be. And here she comes. Oh, 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 my. Oh, my goodness. We're going to have to find out a lot more about this lady. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another sensational hour of international all-star wrestling. I'm your hostess, Liz Hewlett. You know what? Liz is the love of Randy's life. And we happened to be around when they first met. I mean, you know, they met uh, down in our territory. Lexington, Kentucky on Richmond Road had a gym called the Sinte Sports Center. Elizabeth was the first person you saw in the morning and she would hand you the towel and the key to the locker room. And that's how Randy met Elizabeth. They were married on December 31st, 1984, approximately six months before Randy went to the WWE. The poem for us all. Part of Randy's deal was he was gonna bring his brother, Lanny Poffo, later on became the genius. But Randy also wanted his wife, Elizabeth, to have a role in the company. His legend has it that Randy originally wanted Liz to do some broadcasting work for WWE. And then Vince took a look at her and said, No, you're not gonna be a commentator, it's a waste. You know, so she became the manager. What a beautiful woman! It was kind of the prequel of all these reality shows. Randy Savage selecting Miss Elizabeth to be his manager and giving her that proverbial rose. Her being in his corner, I think it was revolutionary. The Bachelor, The Bachelorette. Randy was one of the very first real scenarios of love on TV. People could just kind of pick up on the energy of that realness that was actually happening in real life. It was a unique pairing because she carried herself so beautifully and she had an elegance about her. It was kind of like this Beauty and the Beast sort of dynamic. That's what made Macho Man Macho Man. You know, you got this queen, man. You know, everybody wants the queen. I don't know what in the world. We're gonna have to find out a lot more about this lady. But she's not a macho man in my book anymore. Oh, Billy Jack sticking his nose in personal business. Oh, look at that. Scooped Elizabeth right around and look at that. Give me a break. At ringside, he would sort of give her a look sometimes that's like, you better, or there was an inherent threat to the relationship of Savage and Elizabeth. Don't get me wrong, I assume that part was him hamming up the character, but it's still uncomfortable to see now. He developed that persona, but he started using that personality in his real life. Randy was so protective of Liz. He started bringing her to the matches before he actually got her into, into the business. And he would put her in his dressing room and literally lock the door when he wasn't in there with her so that she couldn't come out and nobody could go in. It was almost like a way to dominate her. Once again, they did not treat Elizabeth very well. The way he interacted with her, and you know, you put the voice, ooh, yeah, don't look at my wife when she walks through the dressing room, brother. I was watching him, it was like, okay, I get it. You know, he's the dominating personality of this relationship. The right chance in uh, beating him up. Randy made it clear to everyone, Miss Elizabeth was his and his only. You jump out of the ring and take Ms. Elizabeth and move her to the other side of the ring and tell her, you're safer here. You don't know if it was a controlling factor or if it was a sincere, heartfelt protection that he wanted for Miss Elizabeth. He believed in his gimmick. He lived his gimmick 100%. And he became the macho man, even when Randy Poffo. I question his treatment of Elizabeth. You have to believe it. You have to actually believe it and feel it and live it. If you don't do that, you're not going to connect. Randy lived it. I'm Antigua, and he's ready. Oh, look at that. Give me a break. What do you call that, Jess? I think the first thing that I perceived was obsession. Oh, this guy's 
happens a lot. Some fans don't appreciate the I think little kids were like, stop being mean to Elizabeth. We liked her. She was like our nice second grade teacher that was beautiful. And we're like, leave her alone, Randy, you're mean. But it's so good. It was such good storytelling. Randy Savage had this beautiful woman that he loved, but no one was going to talk to her. And she better know her place. Elizabeth, I've got to compliment you on that. Just a, a outstanding jewelry. That is very, very attractive. On a very attractive lady, I might add. Oh, thank hey, you very minute, much. Wait a minute. I didn't tell you to talk, did I? Did I tell you to say anything? No, I told you to say nothing. Didn't I tell you that? What a dick. I want to watch this guy get beat up. Tampa's a great town, it really is. It's kind of a white trash version of Miami. Tampa's known for strip joints, pimps, shock jocks, sex tapes, macho, Hogan, stuff like that, great stuff. This is still the hotbed of wrestling. Everybody from John Cena to the Big Show to Edge and Christian, Roman Reigns, everybody lives here in Tampa. Actually started during the 70s. When I first went up to Minneapolis to New York, I started bringing some guys down that were single. And the next thing you know, we had a whole crew here, man. It was crazy. And Randy got the job in the WWE, and I got in his ear. I got him and Liz to come down. Randy and, and Elizabeth were just so much fun to be around. You know, just normal people. Nice, really kind, normal people. The relationship with myself and my wife and Randy and Liz, we hung out all the time. Yeah, this is unbelievable. They lived right down the beach from us, so every day, when we were home, we were all together on my boat or at the pool or at the beach. We hung out with them all the time. Therein lies the problem. Hey, Hawkster, what's the deal, brother? Talk to me. It's not like you to leave me hanging and just checking out the babes and just leaving me out there. We need to have a little talk, brother, about who cut out on who. All right, let's do it right now. Come on. All right. Maybe they're gonna fight. Randy and Miss Elizabeth threw a party, and we were so excited to go because my sisters and I all wanted to be like Miss Elizabeth. My dad and Randy were really close friends, but for us, like, we were still like in awe of Miss Elizabeth because she was the woman that we saw on our TV screens. As kids, even though our dad was a WWE superstar, we were still fans. They had a beautiful home, and they had really beautiful artwork. It wasn't a mansion, but it was just this beautiful home that was so well taken care of and so pristine. Their house was immaculate. Like, I felt like when we walked in, we had to, like, take our shoes off right away and put on little, like, booties. So I felt like he may have had OCD. <laughs> when I met Randy, he was the macho man Randy Savage. Ooh, yeah! 24 hours a day. But what he didn't have was the look. He needed to look like a star. I said, bro, I got a guy named Michael Braun that when I played in a rock and roll band for 10 years, he made all of Hendrix's clothes. He made all the stuff for the guys in my band. Randy calls me on the phone. Hulkster told me, you can make me some clothes. I'm going, who's this? He comes with Miss Elizabeth, and he brings me shorts that have three stars in the front and maybe two-inch letter across his tush. It says, Macho Man. And I say, dude, I need real estate. I need from the floor to past your head. He says you can do whatever you want. This is the kiss of death. I make him five outfits out of spandex, but full length pants and shirts. And maybe there's a little fringe here and there. We're just starting out. In the 80s, there was a series of pimps. One pimp would bring another pimp often to us, and they'd say, about me, he's all right. Yes, there was some inspiration from them for Macho Man's clothes. His, his the costumes fit, man. Every little, the towel, so everything just went down right where it was supposed to go to, you know what I'm saying? Damn, that was a pimp outfit Randy was wearing, man, when you think about it. Like, ah, uh -huh. Randy Pimpin' Savage. <laughs> <laughs> The guy that dressed the pimps in the 70s end up being one of the most influential costumers in all of wrestling. That's how Tampa rolls. A real funny story is he wanted a, a really fast car, you know. A buddy of mine had one. So Randy went out there, looked at the car, bought it, had the car sent from California. He called me, we sent the damn car back. So what's wrong with the car? 
He goes, my hat box won't fit up front in the trunk. I guess the only place there was a trunk was in the front of Ferrari. So he put the hat box in and he wouldn't close, so we had to send the car back. Hats are doing good. Now we got hats, we got glasses. I'm painting on his shirt, on the hat, on the sleeves, on the pants, on the back of the jacket, Macho Man. Over and over again. How many times can you write Macho Man? How many times can you paint the name? How many fonts can you use? Nobody can wear Randy's clothes, nobody. They all look silly. There's something about this person fits these clothes. And he did spend money on his outfits, and they were lavish and extraordinary and colorful. Randy spent a lot of money on the perception of who the Macho Man was. And that was all out of his pocket. Michael Braun made a fortune making Randy's clothes. And he wouldn't buy you a cup of coffee, but that's another subject. Randy saved his money. He was smart. <laughs> that's a nice way of saying he was cheap, but that's OK. <laughs> Well, Randy was making a lot of money. Randy probably held on to every nickel that he ever earned. His mom and dad didn't always have it easy, and his father had to work really hard for every penny that he made. So Randy's father, Angelo, instilled in both kids, save your money. He would drive from Memphis all the way to Louisville, Kentucky, wrestle in a match, and then he wouldn't get a hotel. He'd sleep in his car. It was a lot of fun having him with us on the road. I don't remember him ever buying, I'll, I'll say that. <laughs> Circumstance. What a song. All these other wrestlers had, I'm gonna beat you up, and that like crunchy, like 80s, 90s guitar of like, I'm a man, I'm a man. And then you just had this classic, elegant pomp and circumstance, and the second it hits. Macho Man Randy Savage is the definition of pomp and circumstance. I think that that was the perfect music for Randy. What I think made Randy such a good wrestler is the, the combination of his athletic ability and his personality and his work ethic in the ring. Man, he was just on the cutting edge with all of it, always. He was extremely professional when it came to his preparation. He spent more time on the preparation than some other people did, a lot more than I did, and it showed in his work product. Guaranteed. One, two, three. You know, my phone would ring at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. Hey, I got an idea about that finish at Madison Square Garden. I'm going, Randy, it's 4 o'clock in the morning, brother. I don't care what time it is. You should care as much as I do. I'm like, OK, I care, Randy, I care. It was always just banging heads with him. He'd, oh, instead of the big foot before I go out of the ring, how about just elbow me back over the top rope? I was like, OK, Randy, fine, talk in the morning. But he was always on, man, and he was a wild man. I think he would really overthink it sometimes. He was too calculated, you know. Sometimes you gotta like free form in the ring and you hear what the crowd wants instead of going to the corner and hitting the guy. You may wanna grab his arm and bite his thumb off or something, you know. Cut out the costumes, cut out the crazy voice, cut out everything. At the core is a man that knew what it took to be great. He knew the work, he wasn't afraid of the work. He put in the time and he put in the effort. And I think that's a beautiful thing that anyone in any field could look at and realize that's what it takes. Look out, Macho Man, up on the top turnbuckle. Oh, back. Go put in the work. Go fail. Get back up. And then you'll have your WrestleMania 3 moment with Steamboat. Heavyweight champion, along with Elizabeth. Along with the man who will be in his corner, George the Animal Steve. Right, nice block by the driver. This is the WrestleMania Report. I'm Gene Okerlund. Surprise! Yes, yet even another match has been added to WrestleMania 3. Well, this was going to be the biggest thing ever. At least that's what I said. It actually became the biggest thing ever for a long time. We could hear the numbers coming in from the number of ticket sales at the Silver Dome. You know, 50,000, 60,000, 70,000, and finally it got up to 93,000. Heavyweight champion Hulk Hogan. Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant are 
the two biggest icons in our business at the time were the main event. We want a match to, to steal the show. Randy and Ricky were not trying to upstage my main event. They didn't go out there and go, okay, we want to steal the show from Andre. We want to steal the show from Hulk Hogan. They didn't do that, man. It, our goal was to have the match of the night. And to do that, we had to upstage Hogan and Andre. March 29th, 1987. This is going to be the biggest moment in wrestling history. I knew that when I watched the whole show, as good as Hogan Andre was, and it was damn good, it didn't hold a candle to Randy Savage and Ricky Steamboat. Obviously, it turns out that one of the ways that they were able to do that is because Randy Savage was obsessive about that match and worked out every single detail repeatedly on notepads with Ricky Steamboat until they got exactly the match that they needed to have. We had these yellow legal tablets. We got into two and a half pages of these long legal pads. We were getting up to like 160 steps. We started quizzing each other, and I would say, Randy, step number 37 is this, this, and this. Tell me the rest of the match. Number 38 is this, is this. number 39 is this, number 40 is this, is this. We took every opportunity and every advantage going over the match just to make sure they're all on the same page. You got the ultimate good guy in Ricky Steamboat. He's impossible to dislike. Then you got Randy Macho Man Savage, who Savage being, you know, the bad guy. It was just a perfect storm. It had everything you needed for the perfect story. And the story that they told leading up to it had layers. I will not only embarrass you, not only pin you with the one, two, three count, but I'm going to put you out of wrestling for good. They never have a te televised match until WrestleMania 3. The crowd is so big, it's majestic. It's like this gigantic sea of people. The noise of 90-some thousand people. Your body would almost vibrate from when you came down the ramp through the curtain and you're out there for the first time. My stress level rose because of trying to remember 160-some different steps. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. It's never as good as when you have one pure good guy and one evil bad guy, and they're doing things that are athletic and excellent and great and violent with reckless abandon. One fifty nine, one sixty. It is done. It worked. It is perfect. To this day, I, people think it was like a, one of the best matches ever. The goal of a match is to tell a story within a match. How can you, with your body and your face, tell a story to the fans? There was nothing like the rush from the crowd after taking the fans on a ride of 20 false finishes, the sound was deafening. You see the crowd jump up and react. I've watched it a thousand times. I still get the chills. It's the definition of what the art of professional wrestling is supposed to be. And I'll never forget Savage when I covered him. Randy goes, we got him, Dragon. We got him. A very despondent former champion, the Macho Man, and Elizabeth. It's a labor of love, and it's a craft that when done at the highest level, is art. 
Savage, even though he was obsessed with living the character, didn't seem to care about wins and losses. I'm gonna lose to Steamboat at the biggest thing in front of 93,000 people? No problem, it's gonna be awesome. We're gonna make it incredible. A truly great wrestler should be as happy when the third count hits if he's on the top or looking up. It should be the same thing if the crowd reacts. You should be happy either way. The match actually ruined his life because he could never top that night. He could never top the match. His, his standards were too high. After WrestleMania, that's where it all blew up right there, man. Unleash the lightning power of the tornado, the sheer power of the barber, and the firepower of Sergeant Slaughter. Perfectly ridiculous. With Mr. Perfect, you can achieve perfection. Wrong, oh, Randy and I, I think we had 300 licensees each at one time. So Randy was running neck and neck with my merchandise. Figures sold separately. Perfect. Everywhere they booked Randy Savage and Hulk Hogan, it was always, always sold out. Everywhere. We couldn't do anything wrong. Macho Man Randy Savage, high in the air. Hogan wasn't threatened at all by anybody. And there was no one in Brown that could touch Hulk Hogan at the time. But Randy Savage was came close at that time. I feel real strongly about this man right here, yeah. This is the man who is going to lose to the macho man, Randy Savage. Isn't that right, Elizabeth? Randy was a little more indoctrined to it and knew the life style because of his uh, being the second generation of his family, whereas Terry kind of stumbled into it. And I think that maybe Randy always resented that a little bit, that Hogan not only stumbled into it, but also became the biggest and outshined him. There was no jealousy over anything like that. No problem at all, baby, no problem at all. You see my T-shirt? In a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, everybody's gonna be seeing the whole cool Vince McMahon. I think everyone that has been or will be ever in the WWE will be in Hogan's shadow. I don't think Randy ever thought he would overshadow the hoaxster. Hulk Hogan was gonna be the unbeatable guy. That's the way it is. Those eyes right there, those eyes. Lust Elizabeth, you understand that? You got my face, you got lust for Elizabeth right there. I, I think Randy Savage doesn't get nearly enough credit for how important he was to the success of the WWE at that time. Hulk Hogan seems to be the guy, it's like there was Hulk Hogan and there was wrestling. <laughs> He was intense. Mix a little intensity with the right toxins and the right poisons, and you can get a little crazy. Get out of the way! No! Somebody get the help back there! No. Tonight is the first time that I've ever been the prize in a match. If Randy wins, I stay with him. And if George wins, he gets the title, and he gets to keep me. Tonight is definitely the scariest night of my life. When we look back on Randy Savage's career, so many of the most influential matches and storylines of his career involves Miss Elizabeth. So without her being a foil and a catalyst in this storytelling, we wouldn't remember those iconic epic matches. He'd grab her and push him in front of him. I mean, he was the king of that move, of grabbing her and being like, uh uh, no, not today. You know, like, we're gonna hit my woman? And you're like, what a dick. To use Elizabeth in the storyline was so easy. Looking back, we weren't setting a good example for kids watching at home. It's not something we do today, but we learn and we move on. It's professional wrestling, man. Uh, I call it the theater of the absurd. Well, anytime you cross that line, that, that stirs the fans' reaction. When you stir their reactions, you start putting asses in seats. And that's what it's all about. She was the first major valet in wrestling to be kind of part of the story. The husband wife team working together, I don't think we really had anything like that before, so it was it was unique. Um, Randy was extremely possessive with Elizabeth. Shut up and keep polishing. If I lose tonight, it's your fault. If you're given to be a certain way, and I can take that and boost it up, you know, then it becomes larger than life. It worked. And it just worked. Miss Elizabeth broke the mold. Oh, look at this, manhandling her once again. 
You remove Elizabeth from the equation of Randy Savage, and he's just a guy that talks weird and is incredible in the ring. Miss Elizabeth anchored Randy Poffo to that character. I don't think she had any clue about how talented she was and how beautiful she was. She didn't have a healthy body image. Liz struggled with eating disorders. She struggled with bulimia. So she really struggled with just self-confidence. She tried to be what she thought the man that she was having whatever relationship at the time with, what they wanted her to be. So she would get lost in the relationship. I was the first one to push Liz down in a, in a very physical altercation where I shoved her sideways. That was really, really a big deal. He asked me to come up to his hotel room, and we went over the pushing of Liz for about two hours. She was falling on the bed when I was pushing her sideways. How they got Randy to go for that or to do that, that's a mystery. Thirty or thirty-five million people tuned in to see it. They came up with the idea of the slap. Not me. <laughs> that was the last thing I thought I'd ever do. I got more heat from the fans for slapping her than I did for the snake biting Randy. The wrestling fans destroyed my car. They totaled it. Knocked all the windows out of it. Busted the headlights, the taillights. It's like the thing with slapping a woman. You don't do that. That's that's ingrained in here, man. This is, that's one of the two top evil things you can do. Can you imagine somebody slapping somebody today? Randy and Liz were married in real life. However, on camera, their relationship was never, it was never exposed and it was never talked about. It was more of a, an animal magnetism and attraction. Randy's character changed. Randy went from a very popular character to just a despised character, the Macho King. Savage goes full bad guy because of jealousy, a very real reason to turn. Elizabeth is out, Sherry's in. Queen Siri, what kind of rules are there? No! She turns on the Macho Man. In the crowd, Elizabeth. When she came back and slapped Sherry, come on, come on. Everyone popped, everyone went nuts. I loved it. Hello, Howard. Bring us up to date on the travels of the World Wrestling Federation. I mean, you could be in Dallas one night and Miami the next, and then up to Chicago the next, and this would just keep right on going. And the, the traveling part was the hardest. We were running so hard in those days, man. We were running seven days a week, every night. Our way of dealing with it was the right. Guys were doing steroids. You guys were doing a lot of pills, man. You know, and a lot of pills. Some of us, including myself, did fair amounts of cocaine just to get going. Your body needs time to heal. These guys, their whole empire is built upon their physique, so to speak. So I got to think that's very, very tough on them. I mean, it's a world of action figures. And when you put yourself out there as much as wrestlers do, your body ain't going to keep the body of an action figure. It's tough enough to do it by yourself, not to imagine having your wife there with you every step of the way with, you know, sharks tagging behind. Randy really loved her, and I know that he wouldn't have it any other way, Miss Elizabeth with him. You know, the business is tough. It's just the road, and it's just, it's just a tough business. I, I don't know of any husband-wife teams that have done it since. There's, some, you know, probably, but there's probably a reason why that doesn't happen a lot in wrestling, because it's just, it'll ruin you. I guess in hindsight, she just finally couldn't take it anymore. Not only sometimes was Randy overprotective, he was a little bit overbearing on Liz. And I really think that she just reached her breaking point. I think he always felt like there was somebody else in her life besides him, when there really wasn't. How could it be? You're locked in the house, and you can't go out on the road. Nobody can touch you. Nobody can see you. How in the world could she fall in love with anybody else?
Elizabeth, I love you. Wow, wow. Wow. Yes. Will you marry me? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> when Randy the Wrestler and Miss Elizabeth were having a great life on TV, they were having a horrible life in real life. And I think that was a huge, huge accelerator, so to speak, of the demise. Can you imagine that? Like, if your marriage was seriously in trouble and you had to publicly get married again, so the world is kind of like, oh my god, that's so cool, you guys are married. It's like, no, no, actually, we were married, and now we're barely married. I wonder how much of the worst of him was brought out by the wrestling business. It clearly brought the best out of him professionally, but I wonder how much it cost him personally. As the orchestra played, the formal line of the eager guests gave their congratulations to the happy couple. I remember Randy coming to me. Liz is very unhappy with me and thinks she wants a divorce. And I said, well, maybe she just wants a little bit of freedom. But I knew he was really heartbroken over that, you know? I don't know if anybody ever looked at the Randy and, and, and his wife's situation and said, hey, maybe I should step in and say something. If you knew Randy, I don't think that would have set well with him. I think maybe later on, Hulk Hogan and the time Hulk's wife may have crossed that line, and, and that didn't go well either. I didn't realize that Wiz was uneasy. I just remember Randy had just bought a boat. My ex-wife was on the dock, and you know, they were, her and Liz were talking. She goes, yeah, well, Terry's going down to Miami to shoot a movie called Mr. Nanny. We'll be down there a couple months, and I'll be there with the kids, and he's going to be working on it. So if you get bored, come on down and hang out and help me with the kids. So I went down the next day to Miami, and I was shooting nights. And uh, I guess I left for work about 5 o'clock. And when I came in at 6 in the morning, I saw the red uh, Cadillac out there. Hmm. That's Liz's car, you know? I go upstairs, and I said, where's Liz at? Uh, my ex-wife was still asleep. She says, oh, she's in the back room over there. I just kind of peeked in the other room. No one was in the bed. And I went, hmm. I didn't think nothing of it, so I went to sleep and uh, got up, worked out, did my thing. The next day, I went to work again at night. I came in, same thing. Nobody in the bed. I said, OK, here's the deal. I don't know what's going on, but if she's not going to be sleeping here, she needs to get her stuff out of here, because I don't want any heat. And so as things progressed, um, I saw her down by the pool hanging out with the guy that played tennis. And I was getting ready to go to work at night. And I came out of the shower about 6 o'clock, and I heard him screaming, oh, where's she at? Where's she at? You don't even know where she's at. And I said, oh, my god, he's here. So I put a towel on. I went out in the living room. And there was Randy standing over my ex-wife, pointing his finger, going, you know where it is? I said, Randy, calm your you know what down, brother. Grab the manager. I said, hey, brother. This is Macho Man, his wife's here, he didn't have a key to a room, we need a key to a room. So the manager walked us all the way around the back of the hotel. Guy put the key in the door to open it, Randy pushed the door and goes, hey, Liz, and I took off, I was gone. All of a sudden, I get ready to leave to go to work, and there's like 20 cop cars outside the hotel. I was blamed for that. The truth is, after the second day, I should have called him right away and said, hey, man, I don't know where your life's at, but her car is here, she's not in her room. I should have done that, I guess. That's where our relationship fell apart for about 10 years. It's just as intense as the wrestling was, that's how much he hated me in real life. I just figured if I got her out of my room, I had no idea she didn't call home. I had no idea that she left and packed all of her stuff up and didn't tell him she was done with the marriage. I didn't know any of this stuff. I just thought she came down to hang out. She left him and didn't tell us. Let's just be honest, the day that Randy died, he still loved Miss Elizabeth. Like, I mean, that's his ultra love in life. And so as he's losing her in real life, he has to act like, you know, worse in love, getting the whole nine yards. And so, I mean, I, I can't even understand how much pain that would be. Oh, 
boy. That's right, the real deal right here. I'm the Macho Man Randy Savage, and me and Gene Okerlund, I'm going to be your co-host, yeah, on All American Wrestling. Do you have any problem with that? I, I don't have a problem at all. I don't I'll know why I'm Vince puts people on commentary done. other than the fact that he might have another vision of what needs to be done for the product. Vince, I don't think, wanted him to work anymore. They wanted him to get him out of the ring and do commentary, and Randy always felt like he had some matches left. The, the reason that I argue that Randy Savage is probably the greatest who ever lived is because he literally could do every single aspect of professional wrestling, except for commentary, and was not a fan of that. You gotta be able to get a patent on some of these wrestling holes. People are stealing them. That's the million dollar dream. Randy probably looked at it as, man, do they not think that I'm good enough in the ring anymore that they're gonna put me out here as a color commentator? His voice was a small doses thing. You don't wanna just hear, rolling commentary, oh, up the top, oh, there we go. After two hours of it, it's like, ah, uh, it doesn't have the same mystique anymore. Are you ever gonna get back in the ring again? Absolutely, thanks for asking me that question. I'm gonna just, uh, you know, I've been on the sidelines kind of just picking my shots and I feel an opportunity coming up really, really, really soon, within a week, in fact, and I'm gonna get back into the ring. I'm uh, gonna still be doing the broadcast yeah. because I really enjoy it and I'm broadcasting because I want to, not because I have to. But when I get back into the squared circle, I'm gonna make a quick name for myself again and I'm gonna go after that World Wrestling Federation Championship belt for the third time, a 3 -piece. Randy had a lot of fight left in him, a lot of gas in the tank. He had no knee replacements. Randy hadn't had any major, major surgeries. His legs were good. He tore his tricep and you know, knocked his teeth out one time by accident. But he was in great shape, man. He could go. When they wrestle me, they turn out to be a clown one way or another. Yeah, doink, yeah. doink the clown. Doink the clown or uh, Hulk Hogan the clown or whatever it is. You know, it doesn't even matter. I thought yeah. you and Hulk uh, were kind of friends there for a while. Kind of not, too. Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> kind of and kind of not, yeah. Somewhere in between. Uh, yeah. They said, we're having a youth movement. The best thing you can do is hold on to the mic. He says, well, I'll get a second opinion on that. And it turned out WCW didn't think he was too old. I'll never forget the night that it happened. I remember Vince walking around saying, has anybody seen Randy? I would need to go over the format with him. And then an hour before our show started, somebody came to Vince and said, hey, Vince, turn on the TV. It gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce truly one of the all-time greats in professional wrestling, finally arriving at World Championship Wrestling. I was with Vince at the time, right in the same room, and he no-sold it. There was no expression change on his face at all. He looked around, he looked over at me, he said, King, could you do the commentary with me tonight? But Randy, I know you're out there listening, and uh, on behalf of all of us, all of your fans, and certainly uh, me, the number one fan, I'd, I'd like to say thank you for all of your positive contributions. Even when it was happening, a lot of people didn't believe it was happening. We wish you nothing but the best. Godspeed and good luck. It was a surprise uh, and uh, not a pleasant one. And it was, you know, it hurt. They wanted me to do the commentary thing, you know, which which I will want to do sometime, you know, because I got a pretty good slanted viewpoint on things, you know. <laughs> I feel that I would like to express it at, at some time. You know, it's not even now, but I, I just wasn't ready, you know, to take off my boots at that point. I'm glad I didn't. I don't think he wanted to do that. He didn't want to do that. He wasn't Randy. Macho Man and Hulk Hogan have a date with destiny. Oh, yeah, Starcade, dig it. All right, the Macho Man Randy Savage already making his presence known here on WCW Saturday Night. During the Monday Night Wars, when WWE and WCW were going head to head on TV on the same night, for a long time, WCW, they were winning the Monday Night Wars. And part of that was because a lot of talent would jump ship, and Randy was one of those talents. I mean, he was a big, big star. I think it was devastating. You know, I think it was because he was our captain. I remember a bunch of us were talking and saying, like, man, we're like, we don't have any stars. So we all felt maybe there was a shift going on. Like, gosh, 
the two biggest guys of our era, Hogan and Randy Savage, are there. Ooh, yeah. There was a huge rift with Randy and, and Hogan. So when Randy went to uh, WCW, it was always a, a very business-like relationship. It was a really smart move because Randy wasn't done wrestling. Vince told him he was done wrestling, and Randy wasn't done wrestling. He had a major impact on the wrestling business once he came over and got back in the ring again. Randy was highly motivated, so was I. And when you get two highly motivated people that each want really the same thing, then it's just about numbers. And what was really, really interesting about negotiating the Randy Savage deal is it didn't cost me a dime. Because when Randy Savage made the jump to WCW, so did Slim Jim. Want to pick up the tempo? Yeah! Step into a Slim Jim! <laughs> he took Slim Jim with him. And that was to the tune of $750,000 per year. Macho Man got me to eat Slim Jims. So any irregularity I have with my bowels is on you, Slim Jim. I'm gonna take you to court, drop the elbow from it, yeah. Intestinal fortitude, not included, yeah. What do you see? Slim Jim. Slim Jim. Slim Jim! You could tell he was struggling with aging in WCW, and you could tell he was doing whatever he had to do to keep his body in shape. And he got too big. I'm not giving up. I'm just getting started. In that period of time, it was about guys being bigger, stronger, faster. You know, it was in all sports. A lot of wrestlers took the steroids just to heal and to maintain their body. If you're on the road like that, you're not eating properly, you're not getting the right sleep, your body starts to tear down. Did Randy use him? I never seen him do it. Now, if you ask me if I think he did, yes. That's just my own thought. I've been wrong before, though. He got his money in WCW, you know? He went and cashed in, got a nice check, money he could have lived off of for the rest of his life. He did sort of, in WCW, kind of end up in Hogan's shadow again. In WWE, it was almost like he was lurking in the shadows of Hogan, like, I'm right here. I could do this. In WCW, it wasn't like that. He was never a threat to Hogan's spot. I think there was a lot of competition. I think till the day that Randy Savage died, there was a lot of emotional feelings between he and Hogan. It was kind of scary. Even though neither one of them would talk about it, you didn't need to have anybody tell you what was happening. You could see it. They didn't get along. They did not get along. Larry Bischoff came to me. He said, hey, man, you got an opportunity to grab Elizabeth. They were divorced, you know. I went, oh, my God, if we could get her, that would be so intense. When Miss Elizabeth wanted to come to WCW, it was Randy who was one of her biggest advocates. Randy had moved on with his personal life, so there was no excess baggage. He didn't have a problem with it at all. He said, man, if there's money to be made, let's make it. My boy. By the time that I met Liz and we were getting to know each other, I had the sense that she had completely moved on from the marriage with Randy. She had met someone. All of a sudden, Liz was converting to Judaism and moving to Florida. You know, it didn't last long, but she tried. A real man knows how to come to the aid of a woman. What I thought at the time was an innocent workplace flirtation, and sure oh. enough, there is no such thing as innocent workplace flirtation. So uh, working together and being around each other, we definitely cross those boundaries. Take a good look at it, the genetic wonder here, Mr. DNA. My best friend from wrestling, Stink, he tried to sit down with me many times and talk to me about it. Man, I w just, I wouldn't do that. There just wasn't any stopping him at the time. It didn't seem like it was probably the best idea for a number of pretty obvious reasons, but somebody else's life and, and they're gonna do what they're gonna do. When it became obvious to me, I thought, okay, here we go. This is that iceberg that the Titanic hit that nobody saw coming, here comes mine. And it didn't happen. I think Randy was just kind of 
maybe over it, just kind of was keeping his distance. It was like a full circle situation because, you know, if, if I hadn't have done that, then I hadn't have got over it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because, I, you know, I don't believe in taking taking anything to the grave, you know what I mean? You know, because uh, and me and Elizabeth, they're still friends, you know what I mean? Uh, just uh, something that didn't work, and it was, a, it, was, it was a no problem situation, you know what I mean? And just, you know, life goes on, and, uh, you know, just, you know, you shouldn't spend the rest of your life dwelling over any one thing. When he had Liz, I don't think he really went out. When they separated, it was it was almost like having like a freshman in college. What are we doing tonight? I believe Randy Savage met Gorgeous George outside of the wrestling business. I'm not sure what she was doing for a living at the time. There may have been some dancing involved. I moved to Tampa, and the first person that I met was Randy. It was kind of like fate. I totally believe in fate. The first place I work is the Dow House. So I get in there, they give me a sequin gown that I owe money for at the end of the week. I'm on the set list to go on stage. I didn't even have enough money to get a drink for myself. So I'm sitting there and some old guy starts whacking me in my arm. And he's like, girl, buy me a drink. And I was like, you buy me a drink. And he starts fighting with me. So next thing I know, I got grabbed up and thrown outside the Dow House. On my knees in a sequin gown, some guy comes up to me and he goes, hey girl, are you okay? And I'm like, dude, did you just see what happened? He's like, yo, that wouldn't have happened if you wouldn't have been beaten up on Evil Knievel. And I get to looking at him and I'm like, macho man? I mean, this was like a surreal dream. He gives me his phone number and an address. So I got this piece of paper with his phone number in my hand, and I'm thinking to myself, well, he might be cool. She was a lot younger than all of us. She was the perfect eye candy for the macho man, for the gimmick. Where Elizabeth was unplugged, she got plugged back in. Hold all phone calls. We have Gorgeous a winner. George. She was cool. I mean, young, and she was kind of hip. She kind of updated Randy. Randy got kind of a cool factor. Of course, he had his ears. That's when he started wearing leather. That's where he got really jacked. He got rid of all the flair. He was coming out in just like black leather with a necklace. Here comes the Macho Man. Thursday Night Thunder, Monday Night Nitro. It just kept going, you know? There was never no let up. We traveled over 300 days a year. There's the celebration. My sister, she's about 17 at the time. She moved down to Florida to watch my son. So when we went to travel, I trusted somebody. My sister had called me. She said, I'm gonna be wrestling and with Isaac being down here, I need someone that I can trust to watch him. And you know, I'm down. Randy was really nice to me. He was just really focused on, on his work. Macho Man, he would take me to Toys R Us. He would buy different action figures for me and stuff. And a couple times, he actually bought himself as an action figure. It was cool. Oh, that's nice. Is that, is that like a negligent? <laughs> Randy and George had the reputation in town of really partying. And that reputation got out. Oh, I like it. They seem to have a good time. But after shows or matches, they, were, you know, they, they went out together. She partied hard. George was, wasn't afraid. George came from the stripping community, and Randy was, I think, trying to live vicariously in a young type of way through George. I don't know what the age gap was. I think it was quite extensive. Even though he was older, he didn't act older. He was fast going, upbeat. He worked out every day. He was just go, 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 go. That was Randy. When I first met Randy, he was definitely doing steroids. There was veins upon veins. He had veins in his eyelids. If he started to regress from it, he'd see the difference in his body change. So as soon as he thought for one second he was getting older, he'd push more. We would always stop at his mom and dad's, and Angelo would put me in the massage chair. He would take Randy upstairs to give him his medicine. The dad would distribute the things that he needed to enhance his physical being. I would stay in the chair till the shots were distributed and then we'd jump in the car and leave. We were doing alcohol, ecstasy, steroids, uppers, downers. 
He liked to indulge in some ecstasy. In Florida, it was kind of on the scene, especially over in Tampa. He'd sometimes give me two, three hundred dollars, and I would go and get them, and I'd give them to him. Randy would walk around with a thousand dollars or more worth of ecstasy pills in his hip sack at all times. There's one really distinctful time we were high. It was when we were wearing the red outfits. Gorgeous George are in the house. Oh yeah! You're right about one thing. I beat no punk bitch. People were like, "What is he talking about?" We were so high. The macho man and gorgeous George are leaving the building. Oh yeah! Yeah, but he did. Who's he gonna pay? Who's he gonna pay? At the height of my success was the worst part I've ever been in my entire life. I looked gorgeous. I looked beautiful. I looked like I had it together. And at the same time, I had nothing together. I heard about Randy doing things to Liz through the grapevine. I had heard that she had to go to Hulk Hogan's house to hide from him with his wife. I'd heard about her eating in closets. I'd heard about all the stuff. I didn't believe it because he was so good to me. And then as time went on, the steroids gotten worse and worse. And the paranoid schizophrenia started to grow more and more. I was so young. I had no idea how to categorize what I was seeing. I didn't see the side of him yet until now he's looking at me like that. One day, I'm cleaning his house, and all of a sudden, I notice this fuse box on the bottom of the broom closet. I go to open it up, so I put the keys in, and I turn them, and I pull it out, and I open the door, and I'm like, wow, what is that? And there's four screens on top and four screens on bottom. Wow, that looks like my house. Wait a minute, that is my house. He's got my whole house taped and then I hear him coming up the the corridor right and right when he walks in the door boom clicked it put the slammed it I sit there like this he goes are you okay I go he goes what's wrong with you I go take me home now he goes what is wrong with you I go take me home there was things that he would say there's no way he would be able to say that if he didn't have some kind of camera or audio video in our home because he wasn't there. That's when it got creepy. There was some times where, you know, you could feel the tension between them both. Being that young and being around a lifestyle like that, it was really busy, you know? Everything was just really constant. Randy had it. Upon delusion of our relationship would be a termination of every kind of contract. He knew what he was doing. When they broke up, she went from Gorge George back to Stephanie. Done. Randy cut her out of every single thing. We ended up leaving Florida, and she got a place back in her home, Rockford. And we got her own house there and stuff. And Randy was really pissed off about that, you know? And he wanted her. He just wanted her, you know? And she didn't want to be a part of it. Nobody knew what I was going through. And I've never really opened up and told anybody. I don't want to tarnish somebody's reputation who was such a great person. The things that were bad were very bad. But the things that were good were very good. Miss Elizabeth was very pristine, was always on this extra pristine pedestal. I think she may have jumped out of Randy's frying pan into a, a hotter skillet, so to speak. I think the ongoing scuttlebutt amongst the boys was, this is not going to end well. We definitely did not put the brakes on. Might have been a good idea, but we didn't. In retrospect, of course. In hindsight. Because she was so deep into this relationship, she was around us less and less. She's a little more isolated. We were concerned and we were worried and we would always reach out to her and, and see what we could do to help her, but it just wasn't working. Just a wee bag, well. 
was surprised she was running with Lex. Lex was running real hard, and so were some of his friends at the time. And when I saw her with Lex, I told Eric Bischoff we'll be reading about her in about two years. That I'm not getting pumped out in my hometown. Let me just tell you that right now, by you or anybody else. You know, if he wants to fire the first shot, that's fine, because I'll fire the last shot machine gun style. You know what the sad part is about this whole thing? I'm supposedly the enemy, and I'm this no-good son of a bitch. Whenever. Randy and Hulk had a dysfunctional relationship, much like many marriages that I've witnessed over the years, where a husband and a wife kind of tend to fall in and out of love with, with each other. If all the moons line up just right, you know, and everything is just great, and it's a sunny day, you know, they might be able to work something out. It was that way with them. You know, they had their wars, you know, in Florida. Randy Savage got on another radio station and talked crap about me, saying that me and Hogan are having sex. Oh, that's fine, Randy. <laughs> the girl you used to have sex with now is doing pornos. Join me tonight at Stormin's on the big screen, and I'll play the gorgeous George tape. It was all apparently real. They were always kind of hot at each other. When he started on me, I started on him, you know, and I had a bigger voice than him because I had a bud, buddy here in Tampa that had a local radio show, and we just blasted him every morning, drove him crazy. Making fun of Randy kind of gravitated to my airwaves fairly instantaneously. So within a few months of, of, of Hogan and I hanging out, we just started kind of ribbing Randy. Everybody look, it's Randy Macho Man. Working out at Gold's Gym, he just shit his pants. Oh, it just drove Macho Man in, in, insane. Macho Man would go to lawyers in town and be like, oh, yeah, there's this fat radio guy who's talking a bunch of crap about me that I poop my pants. And then the lawyers would say, well, Randy, did you poop your pants? And like, well, yeah, well. <laughs> it's the debut release from Macho Man, Randy Savage. Listen to him throw down with such songs as Let's Get It On and Be A Man. At some point, I look up and I see that Macho Man Randy Savage is a rapper. And he's not kidding. I've been putting my music as a priority one. You know, everybody's writing a book, and I'm not writing a book. I'm, I'm, I want to express myself with music. I think the entire motive of his rap album was to try to take a shot at, at Terry. Uh, I, I just think. I don't know. You know, it didn't really gain any traction anywhere, you know? It was just one of those things, get it off his chest. It was part of that hate that he had to get rid of. Randy had a plan that Be A Man Hulk was going to sell 50 million copies. Instead, it only sold 50,000. The critics said it defied physical possibilities. It sucked and blew at the same moment. I don't necessarily know that any of us are really proud of it. You know, I mean, I wouldn't be a man if I didn't say, you know, to the camera that I was sorry for the things that I said. Get a shot of this right here, oh, you yeah. hear me? Snap into a slim savage. Boy, if you don't got it, you don't know what music is. In other words, nothing untypical about the evening. We were hanging out, uh, watching movies, uh, having a few drinks and popping some pills. Like she dozed off on the couch for a minute. It was late at night, so. Went over, I realized definitely there was something wrong. So I immediately called 911. She's laying on the floor. I tried to pick her up. I tried to. Uh, okay, what I want you to do, I want you to go over and see if she's breathing. I can't tell. Please send somebody here who knows what they're doing. And I got taken in from there, and they found out all the drugs in the house, and I was placed under arrest shortly thereafter. One day the phone rang. Liz is gone. Pro wrestler Lex Luger is under arrest tonight, and his girlfriend is dead. This all happened today. In Gosh, she just had so much to offer. Both Lex and Elizabeth did what addicts often do, which is hide it. By the time it became obvious to those of us who would have liked to have known, it was too late. They were already pretty far gone. She was a beautiful, wonderful, gorgeous woman who had no clue how gifted she actually was. Absolutely, I had a role and definitely a profoundly negative influence on someone who asked, did you murder her? No, I didn't force her to do drugs or take pills. But was I a, a negative influence or time that led to that happening? Definitely. If I could change that and go back in time, I, oh boy, I, mean, I, I, I would, but I can't. I, I think the end for Elizabeth is 
one of the saddest things that's ever happened in wrestling. She wasn't supposed to go that way. Like, she wasn't a wrestler. She didn't abuse her body that we knew of, you know? Like, it's, it's just, it, it's heartbreaking. I never said a word about it. I said, I'm very sorry for Elizabeth. She said, thank you. I didn't pick his scabs. I spoke when spoken to, and if I saw a mud puddle, I didn't splash him with it. We loved each other, but we didn't talk about everything unless he brought it up. I know that he had a lot of fond uh, respect for Lex Luger, and I don't think he held any animosity toward him. At all? Really? I gave my answer. Really feel real bad for her and her family. And uh, it was a situation where we hadn't seen each other in about maybe five, six years, but you know, we had closure and we said hello and everything was all good, but I uh, feel bad for her family. It just sort of ended. And Randy Savage seemed to just sort of fade away from wrestling. He seemed to kind of go peacefully into the night in a way that most wrestlers are incapable of doing. In my whole life, it's because I want to do something rather than having to do it, you know? So, you know, I've uh, been a really good businessman as far as my personal finances have gone. From what I heard, he was doing well. He was happy. A lot of the guys leave this business and they can't get it out of their system, can't get it out of their blood. But Randy seemed to have, have done that. And if you remember, I mean, he was one of the first guys that got a decent part in a major, major motion picture. Hey! Take the chain off! Hey, Brick Joe! You're going nowhere! I got you for three minutes! Three minutes of bleak time! Ah! I got this this uh, little switch inside my brain when you trip that light fantastic mm -hmm. and it's showtime and you hear that roar from the crowd you know what i mean and you get those chill bumps all the way up from nose and toes mm -hmm. and uh then it's not a problem at all you know in fact it's uh, pretty easy for me to get up for something like that you know because it's just it's just either inside you or it's not and i say that when it stops getting to be fun for somebody they need to get out when randy savage was done with people he moved on and Randy would, would cut it off and move on. You didn't exist to him. So the same thing with his personal life, the same thing with his business. It was time to move on, he moved on, didn't look back. And the latter part of his life where he went gray and he kind of naturally aged, I think that that might have been when he finally dropped the Macho Man persona and could be Randy Poffo. And I think that that might have been a huge relief for him. There's arguably no more tiring character to play than Macho Man. I mean, just from a physical voice standpoint, you can't tell me there weren't times when he was like, oh, I just want to not talk for three days because my throat hurts. Randy had, had reunited with his, like his high school sweetheart. To me, it was like, you know, Randy had found peace. I was at a heart doctor. I look up and there he is, and he looks great. He's about 240 pounds. He's got his weight back. He's smiling. He's happy. It's, hey, Mach, what's up, man? I love you. I miss you. I love you too, brother. I said, damn, you got your wedding ring on. He goes, oh, yeah, I got remarried. I was so happy. He looked so great. You could just see the glow coming off him. He was at peace, and he was himself, and he was happy. It kind of like made my life to, to see how happy he was, and he forgave me for whatever I did. I remember my dad telling us about Randy having met, you know, back in the 70s, a woman named Lynn Payne. And he had this relationship with her before he ever met Miss Elizabeth. In 1975, Randy had left baseball and he and Lynn had broken up. So it, it caused Randy to leave Florida and get into professional wrestling. Randy had told me that Lynn was always the love of his life. They were sweethearts early on and then of course they went their own ways and they found their way back to each other and boom the stars never shone so bright they get married on Lido Beach where they had met 36 years before just tell him that he had just he was zen he, he was still macho but the pace was much different you just see that Randy had kind of, you know, went full circle. There's so many of these guys were so tormented, and then you hear that they died. 
It's like the life of a kamikaze pilot. At least, you know, Randy got to touch down back on the carrier for a while. He was at the point of relaxing and enjoying his life with the, the woman that he was supposed to be with. So he's just in the, in, ready to just, ah, you know, and he, he, he told me that. I got my dogs, I got my house, I'm, you know, I'm there. Randy getting back this high school sweetheart who hadn't been around the wrestling business ever, she wasn't jaded, you know? And I think when he unplugged from this crazy business, he fell back in a really beautiful place that was probably before he ever wrestled. You young punks today got nothing on the macho man Randy Savage and my generation. Randy Savage, at the end of his life, left wrestling in a way that I really respected and I liked because he walked away from it. He pulled a lot out of the WWE, made a ton of money, had a hell of a ride. Circumstances being what they are, man, a wonderful, wonderful life. They were coming back from being at the store. Randy was driving his Jeep. He said, I'm not, I'm not really feeling that well. Uh, I think I'd like to go home. And uh, he started to swerve out of his lane and he pressed the gas. Lynn had to steer. The Jeep was gonna crash into other vehicles, oncoming vehicles, and cause all kinds of other fatalities. So she steered the Jeep into a tree to stop it. And Randy was pronounced dead right there on the scene. Some sad news to report this morning. Pro wrestling icon Randy Macho Man Savage died Friday in a car crash in Florida. TMZ I get a message from Largo Medical and that my brother and his wife were in a car wreck. So I called up and that's when they put me on the phone with Lynn and she explained to me what happened. Police say Savage lost control of his Jeep Wrangler about 9.30 this morning. His wife suffered minor injuries. Randy Macho Man Savage was 58. My thought immediately went to, I wish I would have shared some more moments with Randy. Not, not so much of in the ring stuff, but just going out and having a lunch or something, you know, to the, the other side of Savage. Um, if, if I never would have been able to meet with Randy one last time before he passed away, it would have some, probably been something that uh, <clears throat> would have haunted me. Yeah, I don't think I could have uh, really rationalized it if I never got across and saw him again. He had a heart attack while driving, and that's that's a crazy way to die, but it's also a very macho man way to die. You take a Jeep and a heart attack into a tree, you're like, dude, what's up? And you kind of wonder if he negotiated that death. He's like, what if I, uh, yeah, what if the heart stops and then the Jeep pops over the highway, yeah, right into a tree, and everyone's like, that's a, that's a tough way to go. He's like, very memorable, you know, as opposed to just dying in a, in a bed. It was a very macho man way to die. I mean, it's a sad death. I'm not taking that away from it, but I'm saying, as far as spots go, that's a, that's a suplex off the top rope. For as many people as can be like, oh, it's not a real sport, you know? It's just entertainment. By the way, I have a big update for everyone. All sports is just entertainment. The value that these athletes have is just as great in culture as a competitive athlete. In fact, with ones like Randy Savage, they're greater. He gave us more than physical entertainment. He gave us himself as a person. Snap into a Slim Jim, ooh yeah. A being in Spider-Man. I hope all of those things, these cultural moments, added up to something where he knew, like, I was a big deal. I was meaningful. It's crazy because there are some people whose run as a professional wrestler is amazing because it lasts 20 years. Randy Savage, his run was really seven years, but it's one of the greatest seven year runs of all time. History beckons the macho man. He was different. He wasn't like everybody else. And who was the first man to have The perfect way to describe him, he, he was an enigma. Oh, who pays the book, pays the headlines, yeah. How about a headlock? You know, like pain like this. Like watching an artist paint, he can take you on that roller coaster. 
He had psychology, he had athleticism, and, and he could tell a story. That was him being that painter. I am the new kid on the block. He captured the imagination of the WWE universe. Truly did. Damn it, it was Slim Jim. A whole generation, probably a few generations, have a piece of him in their heart, in their minds, in their memories. Oh, yeah, brother. That was Hulk Hogan. Oh, yeah. Randy affected a lot of people all over the world. You conjure up warm feelings thinking about Randy. And he was very intense and, and wanted to give his all. And I so respect someone like that. You got a clip by a tie, and I'll tell the people that if you don't shut up and sit down. Randy was the real deal. He loved this business. He gave his heart and his soul and everything to this business. And there'll never be another like him. Very few guys have this in their blood and live it, and Randy was one of them. I am the best dude on the planet, and you don't want none of this. How much longer do you think that you're going to, you know, keep this up? Yeah, I'm tapering down. I'll probably go about 248 more years, and then I'll retire for a year and come back and win the world title again. Wow.